We're recording the interview of Joe Smith. This interview is being conducted by Adrian Hill from Wright State University Veteran Voices Project. The interview is being recorded at Tridec Technologies in Huber Heights, Ohio. It is 10-26 on November 24, 2014. All right, so when and where were you born? November 10th, 1953. Okay. Uh, who were your parents and what were their occupations? Thomas and Cecilia Smith. Uh, my dad was an engineer mm -hmm. with the Philadelphia Electric Company. And my mom actually went to study chemistry, but during World War II, left school and you know, went to work with the rest of the women. Mm -hmm. um, she was really a stay-at-home mom back then. Okay. Um, do you have any siblings? Yes. How many? I'm one of four. Okay. Did any of them serve in the military? No. No? Okay. Um, so what were you doing before you enlisted? Uh, school. I finished college. Was I got a degree in sociology back then with a uh, concentration in criminal justice, and then wanted to be a police officer. Okay. So I joined the army. <laughs> I was like second or third on a list, and they would hire one or two police officer. So a police chief said, if you were a vet, you get 10 points out of 100 for being a veteran. So why don't you join the reserves, come on back next year, I'll be able to hire you. So I joined the active duty and stayed for 20. Okay. So uh, what what year did you enlist? 75. In 75. Okay. So um, at the time you enlisted, there was probably some kind of stigma with the military, I'm guessing. Um, just, you know, because Vietnam and everything. Was right. that, were you worried about that at all or did your fa parents or family, anybody have any any words to say about that? Um, I, I, no, I wasn't worried about it. Mm. I mean, it, I was kind of focused, even though I kind of got off, got off target. Um, you know, I wanted to be a police officer, go get 10 points. Mm -hmm. Um, when I did, went through the ASVAB process and testing, uh, my recruiter, the recruiter actually literally threw the telephone book size book of MOSs at me. You know, I walked in after the testing, you know, the next, whatever you, you know, the next appointment. Mm -hmm. He actually threw it across the room. <laughs> What's this? That's, you know, you pick any job you want in the Army. So I tested well. Mm -hmm. um, and then ended up picking, uh, nine, I became a 98 Gulf Russian voice intercept operator. Okay. What was your, um, so you got a degree, you got your bachelor's degree? Correct. In, in what? Sociology with a criminal justice concentration. Okay. So why did you, um, where, where did the Russian come from then? Um, opportunity to study at Monterey, California. <laughs> Oh, wow. You know, just looking, talking to the recruiter, you know, he's a pretty good salesperson. You know, my thought was, I'll become a military policeman. Mm -hmm. And what the chief of police had recommended, you know, do it as a reserve or National Guardsman. Um, you know, and then you can get hired and he'd support the, the reserve duty, obviously. Um, then it was just, well, look at all the p potential opportunities. I could study Russian. You know, back then it was still the Cold War. There was opportunity to, to do something for real, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, four years. It was a four-year enlistment if I, if I, took the uh, the Russian the Russian language training. Mm -hmm. So I thought four years. That's not too long. So it was just a kind of a. A big term, but it was a change of plans. Yeah. So you didn't you didn't have any experience with languages, prior. No, to I, I, in. In high school, I flunked a year of uh, Spanish, then had to go to summer school, you know, before you get to take Spanish, too. Mm -hmm. I was terrible with languages, mm -hmm. and still am. Yeah. So did, did you pick up Russian pretty well then, then? No, I studied my butt off. Yeah? Yeah. But did you, I mean, you, you, you passed enough? I passed, okay. I, yeah. I, and I forget all the, the levels, you know, I mean, you go through your test at all the time. I was like a, a high C or a B student. And then at the end, you, you actually take this test that you, I think it's like one through five. Five being a, um, a native speaker. 
Mm. So you can't test it. Really, you can't test out of five. But um, I think three was the goal, and I, I tested it too, mm -hmm. which was acceptable. Okay. Um, so why, you had a degree. Why did you choose enlisting rather than being an officer? Well, I didn't go to ROTC, or, mm -hmm. and at the time, at least the process I was following, uh, that wasn't provided as an opportunity. Matter of fact, I, I had I signed something that said I wouldn't apply for OCS for four years. I guess because of the level of training. Because I went for a year to, to Monterey, California, which is a very nice place. Studied Russian. Not a great experience, but, you know, I accomplished that. Then went to Texas, Goodfellow Air Force Base for, because uh, through that process, you end up with a top secret clearance. Um, then went to technical training at Goodfellow Air Force Base uh, for like three months. And then at some of these places might not even be open anymore. Then went to Fort Devens, Massachusetts for tactical training, more Army training, uh, for like another month. So I've been in for, let's say, 18 months and I haven't done a lick of work yet. Mm -hmm. So I think that was part of it. Okay. Um so you you joined the army. Um, is is there a reason besides uh, you know the most? Why did you choose the army over the other branches? Well, my dad served in the army in World War II. What did he do? He was a an ordnance kind of guy. Okay. Repaired stuff. He's an engineer. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> so do you remember? Um, so it's pretty much because your dad was, though? That was your... Yeah, I I don't know if I've, I thought of the others. Mm -hmm. I, you know, if I thought of the military, I just naturally thought of the Army. But all my uncles served in World War II in the Army. I don't know if anyone... I mean, I had a cousin who was in the Navy. I, I don't know. Yeah. It's just, when I thought of it, I'll go investigate the army. Yeah. Okay. No, that's fine. Um, <laughs> so, what do you do? You recall departing for basic training? Got on a bus because mm -hmm. grew up in Philly. <coughs> um, you know, went through the the joining process, sworn in in Philadelphia. Got on a bus and went to Fort Dix, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Show up and get you out of. Okay. I mean, do you have any, um, I guess you recall the emotions or anything you were thinking at the time? or? Yeah, I was also married at the time when I joined. Mm -hmm. And it was like, holy crap, what did I do this for? Because mm -hmm. it seems, and maybe you had similar experiences. It, you know, while you're going through the process, it's more of a, of, of a quote-unquote logical decision. You know, if I want to accomplish this, these kind of things could help accomplish that. Even though I kind of veered off, instead of military police, this seems like a, a positive thing. You know, someone's going to train me in Russian, you know, electronics, and go listen in on the on the Russian army. That's that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, step in the right direction. Um, I don't know. <laughs> and then you get there, and it's like what? Yeah, it, yeah. All that's removed, and it's just down to you and this guy just trying to show who's who's the boss. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, the, the shock therapy is is pretty. It works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, you're talking about your instructors there. Um, you know, do you recall any of them? Well, one of my drill sergeants name is Sergeant Green. I still remember that guy. Mm -hmm. Always had a little cigar out of his mouth. You know, never lit, but it was always there, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, do you, let's talk about the first couple of days of basic training, maybe. You said you get off the bus, you start getting yelled at. I mean, what, you know, besides being like, holy crap, what did I do? What was that, what was that like for you? Just the experience overall. Yeah, one of my uncles said, just just 
you know, don't volunteer, stay out under the radar, stay under the radar, just be quiet. You have to survive. Mm -hmm. Don't be the tallest, the biggest, the ugliest, the prettiest, you know, mm -hmm. just blend in. So that's what I, that was my approach, you know, getting off the bus and they picked on the biggest black guy in the group, mm -hmm. you know, and chewed on him. So you just, I, I don't know if I remember, you know, exactly the, the first few days, but it was just trying to survive, you know, because mm -hmm. you just, you just shuffle like cattle, get off the bus, get in here, listen to this guy, uh, you know, watching Stripes is, it's pretty realistic in a lot of places. I mean, exaggerated, but you know, they just they look for the outliers, mm -hmm. and they use those for examples, right? You just just kind of blend in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, how did you how did you adapt though to the to the the, the regiment to the physical aspect of it to the lifestyle? Uh, you know, the barracks food, all that. Um. Okay, I had been training to be a police officer, mm. which you know includes a physical test. So I, I was in pretty decent shape as far as what they do for basic training. I mean, I could run a couple miles. Um, I never had a really good upper body strength, so I struggled climbing ropes. But you know, I, I survived. I could do it. Um, eventually, I. Uh, became the platoon guide, is what they called the senior um, enlisted person in, in your platoon. Mm -hmm. um, which doesn't mean anything other than you're the first, you know, if someone gets in trouble, you get in trouble too. I, I don't remember anything significant in that other than just always getting yelled at for somebody else. Mm -hmm. But that was part of the leadership training. You know, you, you, you start becoming responsible uh, for others. So, uh, just kind of blended. I, I mean, I, I keep saying blended in, but it, eventually it's hard to blend in as, a, as the platoon guy. Mm -hmm. And I made a mistake once, you know, Saturday morning, the platoon leader shows up or the company commander shows up for an inspection mm -hmm. of the barracks so that you guys can get a two hour pass to go to the BX or something, you know, mm -hmm. if you remember that kind of stuff. And, and when I reported to him, when he came up our stairs and I reported, I, I used the term platoon leader. And I was doing push-ups during the whole inspection. <laughs> yeah. You're a no platoon leader. <laughs> okay, so you said you were the senior, senior enlisted. Were you, at, were you at E4 coming to basic because you had a degree? E3. E3. Okay. Why did you get that? Was it because you had a degree? Was that? Yes. Okay. I know now it's like e, you get E4 if you have a degree and you enlist, but... Okay, well then it was E3, and then after four months, you mm -hmm. pin them. So it was basically get out of uh, basic training, get to your uh, MOS school, and get pinned on for E4. Okay. Back then. Yeah. Okay, so um, there was specialized training. You, you, you learned Russian um, enough to do your job, at least. Uh, what else? Did you have any other specialized training? Yes, the, some electronic training, uh, mostly how to listen to signals, mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, the equipment. They call it electronic training. In 98 Golf, you know, we, we used a lot of equipment, but I also took an extra course on, on jamming, because uh, jamming you can hear audio, mm -hmm. uh, th that signal, so you can, we had equipment in Germany that you triangulate and find the source so I took that that was an extra training okay so that was all part of 98 golf and when did when did you jump jump school that was so I went through uh, an assignment in Germany Augsburg Germany then came back and that was a three-year assignment so near the end of my four-year enlistment I came back to the States and went to OCS okay. at Fort Benning. And then after commissioning, I stayed at Fort Benning for uh, jump school Okay. before officer basic. <coughs> okay. Um, so since you did a couple tours to Germany, can you can you walk me through, so you get out of AIT with your Russian, what was your, what was the technical name for it or? 
the um, voice intercept operator. Okay. So where did you go after after training from that school then? To Augsburg, Germany. Okay. That was my assignment. So Augsburg. you went straight from there to there, straight from. Well, Monterey was the language training. Texas was an Air Force base, so it was joint is the electronics training, mm -hmm. and then Fort Devens was they called it the tactical training. It was really a couple of weeks in the field, mm -hmm. just learning how to live as an army guy in the field. Okay. You know, um, with our equipment, you know, with the with the uh, the signals, most of the time we. Uh, the unit I was ultimately assigned to was a 326. Back then it was called ASA, Army Security Agency Company, mm -hmm. uh, which was a wheeled uh, unit. There, there was also track units, you know, with, with mechanized uh, infantry units. So it's just, a, it's, you know, it's APC or a truck with a van on it just filled with what looks like a bunch of radios. Okay. Um, and then you you pull a generator set. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that was in Augsburg, Germany. Ultimately, the assignment. Right. Okay. So when you were there, um, what did you? I mean, what did you do when you were there in Germany? Um, I mean, from a job perspective, assigned to the we were a tactical unit, so we we were assigned to the. I guess we belonged to the Seventh Army. Mm -hmm. um, so we spent a lot of time supporting units in the field uh, so like reforger we talked about was you know red forces versus blue forces all over you know what was then West Germany mm -hmm. um, and we would sit on a hilltop and listen you know try to find the frequency that that, that columns talking using and then you know listen in that case it's it's English uh, but if we weren't supporting a field exercise, we would spend a week on some hilltop, you know, in West Germany, listen to some maneuver, the Soviet army uh, on the other side, in East Germany, mm -hmm. uh, listening to them, you know, talking on the radio. Okay. Did you, um, was it pretty, did they have like encrypted radios or was it pretty much they just used the, the standard um oh you know tank to tank it was it was pretty much open and that was the extra training I took was the I talked about the, um, the signals training it was listening to certain kinds of some of it the encryption sounds like just airwave noise mm -hmm. but some of it gets distinctive and it has a I don't know, whatever you call it you know, a system to it, mm -hmm. uh, and then you, so you can identify it, you can capture. It. So you could tune your equipment into that. Yes, encryption and then equipment. that that we could hear it or listen and understand anything from it with human ears, but we we had tape machines. Okay. And a lot of sometimes, you know, if you could find something like that, we tape a series, you know, a couple minutes, and then ship that ultimately to Fort Meade. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Um, did you guys have anything exciting on that first deployment? No. Um, yeah, I was assigned to the tactical unit, and in Augsburg there was also a, a field, what's called a field station. Uh, so instead of getting in a truck and going to a hilltop to listen to the Soviets, you, there was a, a huge building uh, with listening posts mm -hmm. um, that brought the signals from antennas all up and down the east-west Germany border. Uh, so I was lent to a unit to do that for a year. Um, and during one of those, um, one of those days, uh, I happened to be listening to some maneuvering where a soldier, I think he was a sergeant, was run over by the track. Mm -hmm. So that becomes important from our perspective, intel-wise. How do they react to an accident? Mm -hmm. You know, do they take care of them? They, you know, so I. It's funny, you know, whatever I was an E4 at the time. You know, you listen in, you, you get the your NCOIC to come over, and he listens in, and then all of a sudden, you know, the warrant officer's there, and you get a lieutenant, and there's a lieutenant colonel. <laughs> 
and then other people start listening to the same frequency to capture and then I mean back in that day uh, you know you're actually doing it on reel to reel and then you box ship box it up and ship it back to Fort Meade so when you were listening to any of them the you know when you actually heard what they were saying could you understand most of it mm -hmm. or yes. at least get the basic gist to tell yeah. somebody okay yeah. so you knew I mean if they were having a conversation on the radio you know what to you pretty much knew what was going on yeah and but these are soldiers in maneuvers you know so who's who can talk on the radio is the tank commander mm -hmm. um, you know talking to another tank commander or, or then the the squad commander talking, you know, giving. So it's. It wasn't like a conversation about, you know, nuclear biology or something. Right. It was pretty simple stuff. Okay. You know, we're going to move, move there. I want you to flank this. Mm -hmm. You know, it's basic commands, and that's what we were really listening to. Is. Given the scenario of what to expect, was anything out of the ordinary, and then all of a sudden when there was, you know. Oh my gosh! What you do? You know what? You know I I ran over. I mean, I can't. I <coughs> wouldn't probably not be truthful if I said I could understand everything being said. Mm -hmm. But when you know the driver knew he he hit somebody, ran over somebody, and turned out to be a sergeant. You got to remember this is the Soviet Army back then. Mm -hmm. um, so the. <laughs> Um, the language and the the emotion was was pretty high. Okay. Um, so on that on that first deployment to Germany, what year was that? I enlisted in '75. So by the time I got there, it was probably late '76. You were there for how long? Till '79. Okay. And did you come home anywhere in there? No. 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 But I had visitors. Um, I was, because I was married. Uh, I think both my parents and and my wife's parents came to visit. Okay, there. so she lived there with you then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, did you have the ch choice to go home at all, like on leave or? Sure. Yeah. You just chose to stay. Yeah, because people said, "Well, no, 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 no. <laughs> we'll come visit you," because Augsburg right. is in is you know in southern Germany, mm -hmm. uh, an hour drive to uh, Munich. Mm -hmm. uh, the Black Forest is there. You know the Alps aren't far. Mm -hmm. it's, it was a pretty area. Yeah. So did you get to travel around Europe at all when you were there? Um, first time, no, because I arrived as an E4 and had a wife and a kid, mm -hmm. and um, we didn't have a lot of money. Right. We were surviving. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so you get back after that deployment, and then what? Come back. Uh, go to OCS. Was that an easy decision? Yeah, at that point. Okay. Um, you knew you wanted to make more money? Was that? Well, I mean, that's part of it, but um, I, I'm, I was a wise ass, you know? Mm. And my respect for some of my NCOs and officers was lacking. Uh, whether it was deserved or not, I mean, we, we, if I remember by name, we could go through. But you know, some of those were like, really? Is that, why would you do that? Um, so I always thought I could do it better. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I had the opportunity, when my company commander was pinning on my E5 sergeant stripes, I, I was probably the uh, uh, longest. Uh, Time and grade, is that what it was called? Mm -hmm. Time and grade. Time and grade of, for an E4 in the whole Army. I mean, it was a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And that was because I was assigned to a different u unit, so I was outside of my, uh, I mean, it was, it was just at a, down the street, but the whole command structure was different, mm -hmm. you know, when, you, when I went to the field station. So I was recommended by them for promotion, but, you know, things get lost or it didn't happen. So I, when I came back to my unit, um, you know, I sat for the board or, you know, for E5. So when he's pinning in my E5 on, I think time and service, I could make E6. Mm -hmm. But then I had to wait for time and grade for E6, whatever that might be. 
and the, and my company commander was just saying that you know how proud you know blah 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 and uh, well we could put we should be putting these six on you what's your plan what do you want to do because I was also getting ready coming to the end where it was time to start talking about reenlistment and things like that so I think that's where he was headed I said no sir I would prefer to go to Officer Kennedy School if you would sign the, the, the recommendation the paperwork and he said absolutely I'll sign that so I had to get that together and uh, so to circle back to my comment about I was a wise ass I was not impressed with the army mm -hmm. um, and the way we did things until I went to uh, Seventh Army NCO Academy in Bad Tulz, Germany, which was a four-week school. And I don't know if they have. Do they still have an NCO? I hope they do. An NCO Academy? Oh yeah. Yeah. They've got it for each each um, each grade. So when you get E5, E6, E7, there's oh, okay. one for each of them. Yeah. Okay. So well, this is at the E5 level, mm -hmm. and. For the first time, things are explained in such a way that, well, that's why we do that. Mm. <laughs> so for me, right or wrong, it clicked. Um, and, you know, then I wanted to excel. You know, as, a, as an individual soldier, as a part of a squad, as a part of a platoon, mm. you know, th my whole perspective changed from the, f for me in the Army, how I fit. So I, I, I had a better understanding. So I came back from, from NCO Academy a different soldier. Mm -hmm. I mean, and obviously they must have thought something of me to send me there. So after, so your NCO school kind of made you, put you on the path where you decided you want to be an officer then? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so anything from OCS you thought was memorable or? Um, three years of more basic training. Yeah. Uh, at a higher intensity. Um, Did you have um, Bullock? Is that what they called it? Basic or basic officer leader? I don't yeah, I don't know. And it's like for your basically your AIT for officers. This was at Fort Benning, and it was it was branch immaterial is what they called it. Mm -hmm. Sexy sounding name. And branch immaterial officer candidate school. Mm -hmm. So whatever branch you would ultimately be, it all went to the same place. Oh, wow. Okay. So before, I think there were different locations of officer cannon school, and if you were going to be an infantry officer, you went to Fort Bennett. If you were going to be an armor officer, you went somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, so this was everybody, male and female, you know, whether you were going to be MI, a finance guy, or, or an infantry and armor person. We were all in the same company. Okay. And what, which one were you going for? Um, I was thinking I'd go for M, military intelligence, because mm -hmm. that's, that's what I was enlisted. Right. Uh, so that I was thinking of that. I was leaning towards that. Uh, but then I decided I wanted to go combat arms. And just through talking, I mean, there's, there's, it's almost a recruiting process. You know, representatives of branches come in and talk and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, show you fancy films or pamphlets, you know, uh, and I decided uh, for air defense artillery. Some of it, uh, I mean, well, for me the difference was it, it was combat arms, even though it's it's probably not a respected combat arms like infantry or armor mm -hmm. or even field artillery. Um, but you had the ability to go back and forth from a tactical, you know, sure at short range air defense to uh, more strategic, you know, with missile systems. And I like the idea of being able to to transition back and forth. Okay. So um, you go through the, the officer training, and then what's next? Uh, officer training, uh, jump school, which is just three weeks right there at Fort Benning. Uh, you go through ground week, tower week, and uh, jump week. And then head to Fort uh, Bliss, Texas, El Paso, Texas, for air defense officer basic course. 
And then after the basic course, which is like three or four months back then, I don't know. It was a while, a couple months. Um, uh, then you stay for your your technical training, which mine was Shorad, and I would, which was the guns. Back then it was um, the Vulcan Gatlin gun, mm -hmm. and I don't know if we can't remember the name of the shoulder fire. Oh, the AT. Uh it was, I think it's a newer system now, but at any rate, there was a shoulder fire system. Um, I think there was a, a short range mi missile system too. It's amazing, can't remember. Um, but it, that was another couple of weeks or a month or, or something. And then my first assignment as an officer was Fort Bragg. Okay. What'd you do there? Well, after. You know, four years of intel and language training, and then uh, air defense artillery training and, and you know, gun training. Uh, I was assigned to the Eighth Psychological Operations Battalion because mm -hmm. there was eight air defense second lieutenants assigned to Fort Bragg out of my class, at the, and we all arrived at the same time. Mm -hmm. And there, at the time, there was only one battalion of air defense. So how many second lieutenants do you need in one battalion? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, literally, you know, you report in, you know, one at a time, go, and several of our, my classmates were West Point. So, I mean, there was a pecking order. So the West Point guys got assigned, their assignments. So when I spoke to the battalion commander, it was, I can, I'd love to keep you. I'll sign you as a an assistant platoon leader. You know, was like, uh, are there any other options, sir? He says, I would recommend. Yeah, he said, I want to take that job either. <laughs> I, why don't I put put you back? You know, you know, basically throw you back up to to the post, and they'll reassign you. He says, then I, you know. Can't help you. you know, you're out of the the branch, but you might get a, a nice platoon leader position, mm -hmm. which happened. And so I was assigned to the uh, psychological operations battalion, uh, and I became a platoon leader with, in a uh, loudspeaker platoon. That's where a picture I showed you, Sergeant Bunty, mm -hmm. Charles Bunty. You're not going to cut it here, sir. I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so from there, um, where'd you go after that then? Um, I guess I spent like two years there. And it, it doesn't sound fantastic, but psychological operations, uh, that's a, a force multiplier, you know? So if you got the idea with the, with the loudspeakers is if you only have a infantry unit, you know, we have systems that we're playing the sounds of tanks, so at least the enemy might think mm -hmm. there's some mechanized coming. That was the idea behind that. Oh, okay. Um, but we also had uh, the capability to show movies outside, you know, like Tridec does now, except it was, you know, real-to-real -real kind of stuff in a old-fashioned, but a huge, uh, so when you roll into a, an area, we could show propaganda movies or movies, mm -hmm. you know, to the populace. That was part of that process. Um, we actually deployed to Miami, Florida, for the Cubans. Uh, Castro kicked a bunch of Cubans out of Cuba. Mm -hmm. On, I don't know if you remember that back in uh, 1980-ish. 7980? I don't remember it, but I know. <laughs> I know so we were deployed uh, out of Fort Bragg. The uh, MP unit was deployed down there mm -hmm. to help, and we went with them to help with the, whether it's propaganda or psychological, you know, to support them. Because we had loudspeakers, we had movies, so, you know, 
we were shown movies to to the Cuban boat people. I don't know what they refer the immigrants. Or, mm -hmm. um, and you know they were use our loudspeakers to make announcements to huge crowds. I mean, we took over the Orange Bowl. And what you know, all around at the parking lots, where they put up the big army tents. Mm -hmm. So it became a big tent city. So I mean, that was one of the uh, a deployment. <laughs> yeah, no, no, definitely. Um, okay, so so um, you went back to Germany though at some point, right? Yeah, Fort Bragg. Then I went back. Went back to Monterey to study German, to go to Germany. Mm. Uh, and on my way, went through El Paso again for Nike Hercules training. Which is? Uh, which is the nuclear capable air defense, the, the picture I showed you this. Yeah. Uh, that's a Nike Herc. Okay. Um, so, the U.S. Army, the United States owns and controls the nuclear warhead, and we have it attached to missiles we control, but we also attach nuclear warheads to uh, our NATO allies. So, Nike Herc is a U.S. developed system, but uh, Belgians and Dutch and German forces had the system. The U.S. would have a, a nuclear warhead attached to the, to the missile. We were there to control the warhead, and they were there to control the missile system. Okay. It's kind of a weird integration. Uh, so I was sent back to the DOI, Defense Language Institute, to study German, and then uh, you know learn the technical part of you know the Nike Herc system, then go back to Germany. Okay. So showed up in Germany near the Dutch, the German-Dutch border with a Belgian unit. After studying German, I'm working with Flemish-speaking Belgians. Army's great, aren't they? <laughs> but they speak English. So that was a, a, a fun assign, assignment. That was uh, the picture I showed you is a live fire exercise. Units are required to prove they know how to fire the missile. Mm -hmm. uh, we traveled to Crete. Island in the Mediterranean, German, a uh, Greek island. Um, I think every third, three to five years, a unit had to go live fire, and they invited me to go with them. I was the team, the, from a U.S. perspective, I was called the team commander, and a, you know we had a, a battery which we called a detachment, and each team of the U.S. unit, a team supported a NATO battalion, and a NATO battalion would have some number of launching uh, systems of the Nike Herc mm -hmm. in different locations. So I served the, the 56th uh, battalion for the Belgians as a team commander and got to go to Crete for their live fire, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, anything else? Oh, were, let me ask you, were you still with, were you still married at the time? Yes. Okay, yeah. how many kids did you have? Two. Two? Okay, and they all came with you to Germany yeah. again? Travel, follow me all all, all around. Okay. Um, so any, anything, um, how long were you there the second time in Germany? Uh, more than three, less than four years. Because okay. I moved three times. You know, was assigned as a team commander. Then uh, after about 18 months, there was a whole process. When you have nuclear weapons, you have an, uh, literally, you have an outside inspection a week. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. But there are nuclear weapons. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, you have U.S. guards, you have, in, in our case, you know, NATO guards, Belgians, and they all have real weapons with loaded. You know, it's probably a dangerous situation. But you had real live soldiers down there with, with weapons that, uh, uh, and ammo uh, not only available, I mean it wasn't locked and loaded, but they were, the, uh, the magazine was inserted. Mm -hmm. um, so you didn't want anything to happen. So safety was a big concern. 
uh, that was a, uh, how would you explain that? I was going to say stressful, but it was just, you get so used to that level of stress. I mean, it was just, you didn't rest that whole time. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, it was hard. It was a hard assignment. But I, I served as a team commander with the Belgians, then became the, uh, the fifth artillery group um, S1 adjutant. So I was in charge with, I was the S1 um, with our own personnel office. Because with nuclear weapons, there's the Personnel Reliability Program, PRP. Mm -hmm. So I was responsible for the, the MILPA. We had our own MILPA. I don't know if that's what they call it still. The uh, Military Personnel Office. I don't know. So, I mean, the, uh, you know, individual soldiers' records, mm -hmm. personnel records, we, we maintain. Because we had to keep them at a certain high level status, you know, of, of, of all their filings. Mm -hmm. uh, had to be kept in accordance with AR 50 5 or whatever it is. It'd be interesting to find out if that's the right, right, PRP. Um, so I was the, I was actually the, you know, the battalion, the group commander's adjutant, but I was also the personnel office. Uh, that was, didn't know anything about all that stuff, but you know, you live and learn. You, uh, it was a good assignment. Uh, after a little bit over a year of that, uh, that my commander. Uh, and then put me in command of the 35th Artillery Detachment in northern Germany with Nike Hertz with a German battalion. So I finally, I mean, I was using German anyway, I was living in Germany, but I got to serve a, a German unit and did that for about uh, less than 18 months. Okay. Just or right on 18 months, whatever it was. And uh, what years was this? If you want to know exactly, I guess I'd have to look that up. Sure, if you got it in there. Uh, I got the first, you know, the team command. Started 8208. Did that for 16 months. Was the adjutant for 11 months. And then uh, commanded for 15. So I finished in November of 84. So 82 to 84. Yeah. And there's a the Cold War still. Yep. Still going on. Okay. Cool. Um. So obviously you you were you were around. You were exposed to um, you know. Being around high stress, you know, nuclear weapons, obviously that's a big deal. Um, I mean, what was that, did that affect you mentally at all? I mean, knowing that you were around this, you had that responsibility in some part to, to, <clears throat> to nuclear weapons during a, a stressful time and, you know. Uh, I think the short answer is yes. I, there was a lot of responsibility I mean, for the weapon itself, but even more so maybe for the people around it, mm -hmm. uh, the weapon. I mean, we had multiple warheads, and you know, most of them were already assembled on a, on a missile. We could have a missile away pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Which is uh, the point of that, that being there, right? Right, yes. Okay. Uh, which is probably, in and of itself, you know, an important enough and stressful enough mission. Uh, but then the process to make that happen, if you were ever to, you know, to get the order, uh, we actually had a two person, you know, I guess if you see movies in two person control for nuclear control communications. Uh, so that, we practiced that 24 seven. There was always radio comms and, you know, practice messages and two people would have to open a safe that you know had two different 
uh, locks to access the book and you, you know you open a book and you know the numbers and then you would break open uh, it was some kind of plastic thing uh, that we refer to as a cookie I don't know why and you would open the cookie and then that would have the army code for the uh, there's actually a a, a a combo lock on the warhead that you could take the lock off and then arm it uh, so you did. I mean, you didn't really arm the the real nuclear warhead, but you did. Uh, you know, you had practice kind of things. But the comms would always come in. You didn't have to open the two-person safe all the time. But the level of of detail and the requirements to maintain all of those kind of documents and comms, uh, comsec is just off the charts. So did that affect me? I'm sure it did. Um, it's just there's I've not had experience that kind of level of stress you know for three years in varying different degrees but uh, that was that was a heck of, a, of an assignment. Okay. Um, so do, do you feel like the uh Maybe like you said, you had to break the thing open to get the combination and stuff like that. Do you feel like the, the safety precautions that were not there? I think okay. it was pretty safe. I mean, there was never a doubt in your mind that it was just going to go off randomly no. or with one person. No. Okay. Okay. Um, and I had a, a, a warrant on CW4 uh, at the time, and he was sent away to do some, some extra research. I mean, the, the Army or whoever controls, because uh, I know... There's nuclear regulatory, and I forget all the, you know, the, the alphabet soup, but who in charge of what. But I had a CW4 who went off to help do some research. When he came back, he was no longer allowed access to the weapons, the, our real missiles, because he knew so much he could then release by himself. Gotcha. Wow. So you got a CW4, which by definition, you know, he's he knows everything. Mm -hmm. Then he got to the point where he knew too much. It's like, well, thanks. <laughs> I got the best warrant officer in the whole unit, and I, he, he's not allowed to do work downfield, down range. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that was ridiculous. Uh, but yes, there, I mean, from the weapons security perspective, the process, uh, the security, the physical physical security. You know, there was there was fences within fences. You know, we, we the U.S. my unit would control uh, the nuclear missiles, and then there was another fence where there was a, a non-nuclear capable firing unit that the NATO unit had all control over themselves. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um. So I have a couple more things I want to go into before we go into like your reflections. Um. So Cold War, or not Cold War, I'm sorry, uh, Desert Storm, were you involved in that in any way? Not necessarily being there, but... Um, after that assignment, I came back to Germany, went to, from Germany, went to uh, Air Defense Advanced Course, which is supposedly prepare you for command. I had already commanded. I thought that would get me ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. uh, came back to 10, you know, back to Fort Bliss, the advanced course, but now you don't have you don't get to go back to a combat un unit. You go you you're ready to get reassigned to anywhere. So I went to Fort Leavenworth. Um, assigned it's a, a, a training uh, command, mm -hmm. TRADOC command. Um, I lost my train of thought. Was I, where was I going? Um, I asked about Desert Storm originally. So there, I was assigned to uh, a uh, CACTA, and I don't remember what CACTA stands for, but at any rate, uh, we were developing the fielding of the maneuver control system. It was the Army's first tactical command and control computer system. So the Army was actually buying and 
computers to go in tracked vehicles. And they were big, ugly, green things. <laughs> uh, you know, militarized, mm -hmm. where you could drop it, and no big deal. Mm -hmm. And this is back, you know, early, you know, mid to late 80s. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there was, computers existed, but, you know, the Army can take something and make it, I was going to say, you know, make it anything they wanted to, but, uh, so from that perspective, uh, we were developing the, the uh, fielding plans. Uh, then I became the, the chief of the maneuver control system new equipment training team. We took these computers to units and uh, we weren't responsible for fielding the equipment. We were responsible for having uh, the units trained with the fielded equipment. Mm -hmm. and. We trained uh, the units in Germany, 8th Infantry Division. There was a couple of divisions in Germany still back then. And then also 3rd Corps at Fort Hood. And we fielded computers to the whole 3 Corps. And they had one exercise, you know, where they tried to use the system. And this is all the way up from the from the three star down to the tanks mm -hmm. that are now computerized and you know it's a pretty cool system. It had a lot of you know glitches at the time. It was the first time the army was trying to do something that that large. Uh, but they only had that one exercise, which I guess was like a, an operational test. You know, does this stuff work? Can we use it to do what it's supposed to do? Uh, and then three corps was being moved to. Uh, the first Desert Shield, I guess, at the time. And the three corps commander uh, requested the new equipment training team go with them. That's not our mission. You know, we come in and train and, and leave. Uh, and I think Tradoc said, well, you know, you know that. He said, well, I'm not taking these computers unless I have your instructors with me. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously, you know, the new equipment training team was then assigned to the third corps but i had already just out processed i was you know i there was backfilled um was already out processing fort leavenworth headed to to uh, right pat um when that all happened and i went back in to see my colonel and said you know let me you know my replacement doesn't know what i know but with that unit let me go and I was a single uh, dad at the time, and Colonel said, get the, get the F out of here. Take these orders and go where you can. Mm -hmm. um, so th that was my involvement. Uh, you know, I helped train the unit, field them, and then, I mean, we're talking like 50, 60 NCOs mm -hmm. that you need a lot of people to train a whole corps. Uh, that were then reassigned to the Corps to deploy to Saudi, I guess, at that at that point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so then, I, then I PCS to here. Okay. And then this is where you did the rest of your... Yes. I mean, I was really assigned to Redstone Arsenal, Army base in Alabama, with duty at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Interesting. For okay. a uh, missile system. Okay. And then uh, what year... Do you recall that date you got out of the military? Retired from the military yeah. in 95, so it was probably October 1st, 95. Okay. Do you remember that day? Uh, was it significant to you at all? Um, no, because I, um, I had a lot of leave. Right. Term so that yeah. day, I had already um, you know, taken the uniform off and started working for a company on base, you know, a totally different unit, I mean, or a different uh, office. I was here involved in a, what was called the Tri-Service Standoff Attack Missile. The Air Force was the executive service, and the Army and the Navy, the three services were developing a missile system together. Mm -hmm. So I was here 
as a, as a program manager, part of that process. When I retired out of that, I then was hired by a company working for the Defense Acquisition Desk Program Office. Mm -hmm. um, so I had already started that early September. So, you know, I guess technically I was still on active duty, but I was on terminal leave. Mm -hmm. So that day was just a day that came and went, and I had to go get a different ID. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. That I didn't like. I, you know, oh boy, I'm getting a retired ID. Yeah. Well, you know, you got the you still you still were on base, so a lot. Uh, now, how long did you have a job as a contractor then? After. Well, I'm still a contractor. Okay. But not with DOD. I mean, we, we have contracts with the federal government. Okay, so how, how long were you, uh, I guess, because you were with DOD then, right after? Yeah, I worked for a company on a DOD contract on, on base. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess it was an Air Force contract for a DOD system. Uh, worked on base till, uh, I guess it was 2001. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so what about it, what after that? Um, that system we were developing, which was extremely successful, uh, it was a it was a, uh, a knowledge management computer uh, application um, for the acquisition forces for the DoD. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Federal Acquisition Regulation and and all. Of I mean that's a book like that thick as the Bible, mm -hmm. and then each. You know, the Army and the Air Force and the Navy has their own and all the way down. So that system, for the first time, you know, made it available electronically and searchable. And so we were talking, you know, mid-90s. The Internet was just coming around. So this was kind of leading edge technology. And it was a great assignment, a lot of fun. That's where I met all the people I'm still working with. Mm -hmm. uh, Dave London, the guy you just met, was the, uh, the Air Force Colonel in charge of the desk book office. Oh, okay. Um, so I was a, a contractor working in his office. Uh, so worked there. The DOD made a decision to move that to uh, uh, DC, that program. Mm -hmm. And then I just I stayed worked for a different company then, uh, just started working on different contracts. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, did you find that uh, getting out of the military was that hard for you at all? Going from that you know daily. Yeah, I think what really affected me, um, you know, in in retrospect, is I, and you don't know it at the time, but the military position, your military. Time is temporary. Um, you know, because you get so involved, you know, and it becomes everything. You know, mission first kind of mentality, right? That's what we're trained to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you're out, it's like, what happened? Mm -hmm. It was like, no big deal. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, it's just it, it's an it's an awakening. It's like, okay, that was then. That was, did did the best I could. Did a good job. You, you, you use that as a foundation. You grow from it. But it was. It was like, wow, that was that was fast. And I was in for twenty years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so how? Can you give me a couple like uh, life lessons you learned from the mil from your military service? Life lessons. Wow. You take me for a person who thinks, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, people are important. You always got to take care of people, mm -hmm. you know. And I'm, I say that more, not necessarily did I always do that mm -hmm. well or at the moment when you should, you know, because you kind of get carried away with mission first sometimes. I think at least I could. I didn't want to generalize to say 
others. But, um, you know, people, and I guess the Army, we, we, we started mission first, people always. I don't know what they say now, if they say anything. Well, it's changed a thousand times. Army yeah. one, you know. Right, right. So, um, <laughs> but that's, that, uh, that's important. You know, you gotta, you gotta know, and you, you really can't care about them until you, you first, you know, learn, love them, and they know that you do care for them. You know, um, and after that, everything falls in place. If you're doing, if you're taking care of, of your, your people, for the right reasons, because they're people and they deserve it. Uh, I think then everything falls in place. Uh, and then being as technically knowledgeable as you can. And I always felt I was never there. You know, always assigned to, as soon as you became an expert in something, you get reassigned and it starts all over. You know, I go through all this training and go to 8th Psychological Operations Battalion. You know, I can't even spell psychological. <laughs> um, and we're developing things for you know, leaflets that get deployed. Uh, when I ran, had our uh, uh, embassy hostages for 444 days, uh, my unit developed the, the leaflets that were going to be deployed after we took the hostages out, which were never used because that, that mission was got screwed up in the desert um, when the helicopters crashed into one another. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, so, um, never felt like I was, you know, always up to the task. You're always reaching. So, just try to be as technically knowledgeable. Uh, I mean, even here, you know, I'm a PM from training and trade uh, and one of my main functions with the company is now a human resource director. Wow. It takes a lot to get back up to that level. Mm -hmm. Do you think that with the your civilian job now though it's uh, you know a little bit easier you're not jumping around to different things as much or is it still the same challenge? I think it's still the same challenge or very similar challenge. Obviously we don't have nuclear weapons so there's you know I can go home at night and Relax. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, literally, because when I was in that those units with nuclear weapons, when the phone rang, you mm -hmm. were tense because you didn't know what you were getting on the other end. Mm -hmm. um, but there's still a mentality that you have, and I believe it's a good one. Uh, whether it's professionalism or focus or energy or what you want to, you want to give. I want to give my best each time for whatever it is I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I serve, uh, you know, uh, I work for a company with others who served and we have that same mentality. Mission first, people always. Mm -hmm. So it, at least in my mind, even though I know it's different, uh, we try to still attack <coughs> the, the mission or the, what we're trying, the objective for the target, uh, with the same kind of mentality and heart, I believe. Okay. If that makes sense. No, I get what you're saying. Um, so how is your, how did your service, uh, you know, affect how you feel about maybe the current conflicts or, you know, past conflicts and in, in the military in general? Well, I'm, I'm pro-military. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very supportive. Uh, I take care of our soldiers and sailors and airmen and Marines and Coast Guard. Uh, so anything we can do for the men and women of the service <coughs> is probably never enough. And I never served in a theater, you know, in a combat zone. Uh, but now, if you've been, if, if you're in the military or just recently been in the military, you more than likely have, you know, even in a short time. You're in for five or six years and you've, you've been there. I served for 20 years, right in the middle, right after Vietnam and, and right, I mean, Desert Storm did happen. 
uh, the first one. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was back here. Okay. Um, do you wish that maybe you would have been? Well, there's uh, part of you that says, you know, I've trained all this time, and especially that, you know, when my, quote unquote, my sergeants were reassigned to the Third Corps, that was my unit, that was my mission. You know, from an Army perspective, I probably was the right person to go. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was a single, yeah, I mean, I, we just got divorced, and for, for, uh, for the right reasons, I was given custody of, of our son. Mm -hmm. So from his perspective, it wasn't the right thing for me to go, and my colonel was a good guy. <laughs> yeah. Do you think, um, do you, are, you, are you glad now, in, in, in retrospect, are you, are you glad that you didn't, that your colonel well, told you that? Well, for family reasons, for my son, yes. Mm -hmm. That was the right thing in retrospect. Mm -hmm. uh, probably just being, you know, to say uh, gung-ho and I didn't think about it. I mean, I thought it was the right thing to do from a professional perspective, mm -hmm. but probably wasn't the right thing to do for my son. Right. Uh, so it worked out well. Yeah. There's always those two pulling, trying to pull them apart. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, Okay, so anything else you want to leave for maybe future generations that'll view it or any, any message in general? Well, a lot of what I talked about was, you know, more the, the black and white of, you know, my, my military career as I stepped through it. Um, you know, when I joined, I was married and we had children and they moved. Uh, and that's a whole different level of... Um, a whole different story and, and level of concern, you know, what happens to a spouse uh, when you deploy and what happens to the kids. You know, my, my daughter, who's now in her 40s, I think it was her second grade, went to three different schools in three different states. Mm -hmm. You know, what does that do <laughs> yeah. to a kid at the time? I mean, she's very successful. She's a, an attorney, you know, that has her own practice. Uh, but that whole, that's a whole different, not different, it's a whole part of that whole life process, you know, uh, that maybe you should be trying to capture too. Not necessarily mine, but in, you know, in general, mm -hmm. the, the family people out there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anything else we need to talk about that you wanted to get in before we... I don't think so. Appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. I don't know how, how much value any of this is. I felt <laughs> like I've been babbling. No, you're fine. Uh, well, thanks for doing the interview and thank you for your service. Quite welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it, Adrian.